I'll bet you didn't know that St. Patrick wasn't Irish. The original colour associated with him wasn't green and he wasn't even a saint. Strap the fuck in for this one. I'm about to spill the tea. Get it? Because I'm Irish and I drink tea. Okay, moving on. So St. Patrick is a patron saint of Ireland. St. Patrick's Day is in his honour where people around the world celebrate what it means to be Irish. Wear green and get drunk. But there's a lot of uncertainty and confusion around St. Patrick's story, including the fact that he was never canonised by the church. He is believed to have become a saint by popular opinion. <laughs> and that's all the half of it. So the legend goes that St. Patrick banished all the snakes from Ireland, but Ireland never had snakes because we don't have the climate for it. <laughs> the theory is that the snakes that he banished from a top, a hilltop in County Mayo, which is now known as Croke Patrick, Ireland's holiest mountain, also quite a bit more than a hilltop, that those snakes represented pagans because St. Patrick was the one that popularised Christianity in Ireland. And I say popularised because actually St. Patrick didn't introduce Christianity to Ireland. He just made sure <laughs> it took hold. So he stood up atop Crow Patrick, shook his wooden stick about and all the pagans converted to Christianity. Okay. Also, I climbed Crow Patrick twice and this is the better video. <laughs> St. Patrick was actually, brace yourself, British. Yep. The reason March 17th was chosen as St. Patrick's Day is because it is believed that that is the day that he died in around 460 AD. When Patrick, as he was known then, was 16 years old, he was taken captive by a group of Irish raiders who were attacking his family's estate. They brought him to Ireland as a prisoner where he spent six years in captivity working as a shepherd. There is apparently a dispute over where exactly this happened. Some people believe it was up in Antrim and some people believe it was in Killala, County Mayo. That's actually where I'm originally from. So I tend to believe that one. The understanding is that Patrick turned to Christianity to help ease his loneliness in his six years as a lonely shepherd. Six years in, he hears a voice in a dream telling him it's time to escape Ireland. God's voice, obviously, because... Why wouldn't it be? So he walked nearly 200 miles, which makes more sense if he was in Mayo, to the Irish coast, and escaped to Britain, presumably on a boat. But after landing in Britain then, right, another angel came to him in a dream and said, you should go back to Ireland and convert them all. You should go back as a missionary. Again, an angel in his dream. <laughs> Why wouldn't it be? <laughs> he trained to be a priest for 15 years before heading back to Ireland to convert all the savages to Christianity. He ministered to the existing Christians and converted the rest, which is a really interesting theory considering the famous story is that he introduced it to us in the first place. But some schools of thought believe that it was already here in the minority to paganism. So 200 years after St. Patrick arrived, Ireland was fully Christianised and we have been under Roman Catholic rule ever since. Cheers, Patrick. Do you know what wouldn't have happened if we were still pagan? Imagine and Audrey's. That's a whole other video. <laughs> whole other video. Having spent six years here, Patrick was familiar with our culture, with our language, and he used that to sell Christianity to us. For example, he used bonfires to celebrate Easter because at the time, the pagan rituals were to celebrate with fire. He was the one who created the Celtic cross. He took a image of the sun and put it together with the Catholic cross because the sun was a really important and powerful Celtic symbol. And he just mashed it in there to the, <laughs> the Catholic cross. The shamrock at the time was a tree foil plant that poor Irish citizens would wear to places like mass to look nice. And St. Patrick famously, allegedly, used it to explain the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. According to history.com, the Irish celebrate St. Patrick's as a religious holiday. As an Irish person, I never once considered St. Patrick's to be a religious holiday. I never considered it anything other than a day off work to go drinking. But apparently before the 1970s, pubs were even closed in Ireland on St. Patrick's Day. And the Irish government only began to push St. Patrick's Day to drive tourism in 1995. So St. Patrick's Day as we know it, isn't even as old as me. Apparently as well, St. Patrick's Day was the one day in Lent, in the middle of Lent, where you could waive all your abstinence, so you could eat meat, drink, and be merry. This version of events does make sense to me why St. Patrick's Day has become such a debaucherous occasion. It's not that Irish people are alcoholics, but rather that it was right in the middle of a 40-day fast. So obviously, people were going to go nuts. Oprah Daly put it best, yes, I did say that, when they said that St. Patrick's Day started out as a way to honour St. Patrick, and through immigration and secularisation, that's a hard word to say, it has now become a worldwide day to pay tribute to everything Irish. 
There are parades all over the world. People wear green clovers and leprechaun hats. Landmarks around the world are lit up green, including the Coliseum, the Empire State Building, the London Eye, and a number of buildings in Dublin. Chicago even dyed their river green, which I think is both very cool and absolutely nuts. It takes 40 pounds of powder to do it. It only lasts a couple of hours, and they started doing it in 1962. The first ever St. Patrick's Day parade was actually, would you believe, in America. In 1601, in what is now St. Augustine, Florida, there was the first ever St. Patrick's Day Parade. The next parade was not until 1772 in New York City, where homesick Irish soldiers marched to the streets. The first parade in Ireland then was not until 1903 in Waterford, with Dublin following suit much later in 1931. So it turns out America is real entwined there with St. Patrick's Day history. In research to this video, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about St. Patrick, who I thought he was versus who he was. I learned a lot about American influence on St. Patrick's Day. And I also learned that Americans on St. Patrick's Day eat corned beef and cabbage. What the fuck? Apparently Irish immigrants when they went over to America would eat bacon and cabbage on St. Patrick's Day, which I say like it's an obvious thing, but I mean, <laughs> I didn't know that was the thing either. Like I love bacon and cabbage, but I didn't know I was supposed to eat on St. Patrick's Day. But when they went over to America, allegedly, they figured out the corned beef was way cheaper. <laughs> so they swapped it out and now Americans eat corned beef and cabbage as an Irish St. Patrick's Day dinner. <laughs> I just want you to know that I'm shocked and appalled. <laughs> Last but not least, one thing that the Americans have changed is that Americans call it Patty's Day. And the reason that you shouldn't do this is because Paddy, P-A-D-D-Y, is actually short for Porrick. It's short for the Irish language version of the name Patrick. Patty is short for Patricia, the English language female version of the name Patrick. And St. Patricia's Day is August 25th. <laughs> so don't call it St. Patty's Day, it really annoys Irish people. <laughs> I hope you learned as much from this video as I did from making it and check out this video here where I talk about the history of Halloween in Ireland. Salon, salon.